If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Reputations are hard things to earn and easy things to lose. And the car I'm driving today has a reputation. And I can certainly say, as is the case with many automobiles, that in my opinion and the opinion of many others, the loss of that reputation is rather unearned. I'm driving a 1972 Ford Pinto sedan. Sedan because it's got a separate trunk and not the hatchback model or the runabout and not the station wagon. I've got a soft spot in my heart for Pintos because I owned a Pinto. I had a 1973 Pinto Squire, a light metallic green with the full fake wood trim that every Ford Squire wagon has and four-speed manual transmission like this car I'm driving today and it was a blast to drive and I use blast unironically because of course everybody knows that the Pinto is most remembered today for the gas tanks in the sedans not the wagons and the sedans that caused a problem in early models the car I'm driving today is an early model Pinto very low mileage it's got 17,000 miles from new and unlike a lot of sort of zero kilometer cars this doesn't feel incomplete yes the miles are really low for a car this old but it also drives like a very well maintained car this feels like a Pinto that you might have found on a used car lot at the Ford dealer when it was 1973 or so it's absolutely rock solid not a squeak not a rattle handles beautifully the ride is fantastic and you know today when we're obsessed by power to me it's always the package this has got an 86 horsepower 2 liter inline 4 engine and uh, it's interesting to note that uh, during this time when emissions controls were getting ever tighter the previous year's Pinto with this same engine put out 100 horsepower but the power could certainly be described as adequate for what this car was meant to do and that was to fight the basic imports the Toyota Corollas of the world the Volkswagen Beetles of the world and for that it offered far more comfort and 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 performance than those cars did and when you think about this car's company the other import fighters introduced at the same time were the AMC Gremlin and the Chevrolet Vega and neither of them came near the level of fit finish performance and quality that the Pinto had and it's small wonder that the Pinto sold in vast numbers in this model year they sold over 480,000 of them so you know again it's one of those things that today we think about the numbers in which they sell cars any manufacturer would be ecstatic to sell the number of cars in a year they sold of these Pintos and I just come back to the fact that it's easy to build a design and build a luxury car or a sports car but when you design a car which is basically a utility car like this Pinto is and you can do it in a way that is entertaining I think that says so much for the manufacturer and for the design team I happen to really like the way the Pinto looks the design is very clean it's got wonderful little details and especially in this period when materials were not what they had been earlier in the 1950s and 60s and would not yet achieve what they would achieve in the 2000s the very simple use of the plastics and vinyl in this car is really quite good now a performance car this is absolutely not you put your foot in it 
the engine revs, makes a lot of noise, and it doesn't really take you very many places. But once it gathers speed, it's capable enough. And as I said, the handling is absolutely terrific. And especially as equipped with this manual gearbox, the Pinto is a very entertaining device. Automatic Pintos did not have nearly this kind of entertainment factor. Plus, the uh, transmission stole a lot of power from the engine, and the response was not really what you'd want. But, especially as a collectible, I think that the Pinto has a great deal to offer, especially if you can find a very good example. This might be, arguably, one of the best Pintos on the planet. Now, that's not a very small field. Uh, sorry, it's not a very large field. <laughs> but, uh, nonetheless, it's fantastic to be able to sample this car the way it is. When you think about the first round of import fighters that the Detroit manufacturers introduced, the Corvair, the Falcon, the Valiant, they were not really in the same genre as the imports that they were looking to fight. They were really cars that were in a slightly higher bracket. Bigger, certainly more powerful, but not the very small uh, car. And that was intentional, I think, on the part of the manufacturers, thinking that Americans are buying these little cars, but as soon as they have an alternative at a similar price to buy a bigger, more comfortable, more powerful American car, they'll grab at it. And some did, but many didn't. And so by the time the late 60s had come around and the early 70s cars were being considered, they realized that they need to come up with something that was closer in formula to the actual imports they were fighting, and hence a car like the Pinto. It's also been noted that the Pinto was developed very quickly. In approximately half the time that most new Detroit cars were developed, in basically the period of about two and a half years. And it doesn't show, in terms of the car they came up with, this feels complete as a car. It doesn't feel half baked or, or unfinished. And I think that. Today, when development cycles seem to be so incredibly long, it's also good to consider that when a manufacturer is determined to get something done, and in this case, when the leadership or the leader, Lee Iacocca, is determined to get something done, it gets done. And I think that's a, an object lesson for many manufacturers today. Look at your market, decide what it is that you want to build, and then get on with it. Get it built. I have to say that I feel really comfortable and, and sort of back at home in this Pinto. Um, it brings back great memories of that uh, Pinto Squire I had, not least because it was actually a car on which I made money. And I didn't buy it as a collector car. It was simply a used car that I had. I had bought a 1960 Jaguar Mark II 3.8 sedan for $800. And after a fairly short time with the Jaguar, which I loved, the engine needed to be completely rebuilt because of running the, uh, the bearings dry because of oil starvation. My fault, not the car's. I brought my Jaguar to the shop of a friend who repaired and sold foreign cars. It's in the early 1980s. And I asked him if I didn't want to spend the $1,500 that it was going to take to rebuild the engine on the Jaguar, what could he trade me for the Jaguar as it sat? And he said, well, I've got this Pinto Squire wagon you could have. I thought, great, let's do the deal. I drove the Pinto Squire for almost a year and then traded it even up for a 1963 Jeep Wagoneer, which I drove again for about nine or ten months, which I then sold to a contractor friend of mine for $1,200. So I'd actually made $400 on my $800 Jaguar. Not bad. And all because of a Pinto. I really do think that 
the reputation of the Pinto needs to be re-examined, especially as we drive them today. And the recall for these cars did do a new fitment of the gas tank in the rear for these sedans that rendered them much safer. And the biggest problem was not the cars and the engineering, which are no more dangerous than any number of cars built in the 1960s and 70s, and the position of the fuel tank just under the rear bumper. But in the way the Ford company handled things back then, and companies are a lot smarter today than they were then, I wouldn't give the blame to this great car on the Ford attorneys of the time. This is a car that deserves to be cherished and appreciated. It's time to re-examine the Pinto. I didn't have to. I've always loved it.